when I was invited to come today, I thought about what the most useful thing that I could talk to you about was, because you can imagine most of our work is focused on food safety, and some of that's quite narrow. So um, one of the things that we do is a random probability survey that we carry out every two years, and it's around food more generally than just food safety. So I thought I'd focus my talk on that because it does have um, parts of the survey that are really relevant for the work that RAP does and also because we retain responsibility for nutrition in Scotland and Northern Ireland there's also links into the nutrition work. So first of all a bit about the Food Standards Agency. So it's a non-ministerial government department which makes us a little bit unique. We don't have a minister. If we need to report to ministers then we go through the Department of Health ministers but we don't have to get ministerial sign-off to do what we do to make policy, which means that um, if there is evidence that underpins the advice that we provide to government, even if ministers aren't in agreement with it, we're able to publish that advice, and frequently we do. It was established in 2000 on the back of um, the issues around BSE, and its remit has changed over the years. At the moment, we're responsible for food safety, including food hygiene. We're responsible for a really small bit of labelling. That's the labelling around food safety, so mainly food allergy labelling, which has been in the press rather a lot recently because of the change in regulations. Um, we also are responsible for enforcement, although we don't do very much enforcement directly. Most of our enforcement activity is done through local authorities who carry out inspections on our behalf, although we have a permanent presence in all meat plants. Um, we do nutrition, as I said, in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and that provides some interesting opportunities because, um, for the first time, we have a real natural experiment that we're really watching quite closely because the policy decisions in the different countries are taken on a different basis, which means that you can see the effect of specific policy interventions because they're not rolled out right across the UK. Um, the agency uses science, evidence and research to underpin all of the, its policy making and all of the other um, activities that it undertakes. And social science at the Food Standards Agency is relatively new. So it was set up as an evidence-based organisation in 2000 when the Act went through Parliament. Um, social science really started to get a foothold in 2007 when a dedicated team was brought in to ensure that the social science evidence was treated in an equal way to the natural sciences. That hadn't been the case before 2007. Um, and in 2008, the agency established the Social Science Research Committee to give independent scrutiny to the social science evidence that we bring to bear in our policy decisions. So what is food and you? Food and You is the agency's flagship survey. It looks at the UK population and considers the reported behaviours, attitudes and knowledge relating to food safety and other associated topics. It's been a biennial survey. It was intended to be annual, but we were unable to secure funding. So, so far we've got data from 2010, 2012 and 2014. Um, we published the most recent report in September with the individual country reports which do analysis at country level in December. This research was carried out, or sorry, the data collection was carried out for us by TNS BMRB and it's a random probability sample so we're confident that the findings of this evidence are representative of the UK population. But it's a huge data set. It really is enormous, and so we have done what we wanted to look at for our food safety priorities. We're now going on to do some further analysis of the 2014 data, but we're only scratching the surface of this information. There is ever such a lot that others could take and do with the data, and it's all in the public domain. So I would really, really encourage those of you with a research interest in the area to have a look at it. If you can use it, we'd be really, really pleased. Um, we have sample boosts in Scotland and Northern Ireland for all of the waves, so we can see what's been happening in those countries, and it isn't a consistent picture across the UK. For the first time at wave three, Wales also had a sample boost so that they can do with in-country analysis that is also representative. The face-to-face -face interviews which take place in respondents' homes take 45 minutes for the food safety modules and the socio-demographic information, 
The additional 15 minutes in Scotland and Northern Ireland accounts for the um, nutrition module that we also run in those countries. Um, we've also done some secondary analysis of wave one and two, so the 2010 and 2012 data, and I'm going to present some results from that at the end. So as an overview, the topics that are covered in the survey, so there's lots of household information, lots of information about eating habits and shopping, information about food safety, information about health status, because there's a hypothesis that is as yet not completely proven that people who, have, who are immunocompromised have different food safety behaviours because they're a little bit more careful, maybe. Um, and then healthy eating in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Lots of demographic information, so all the normal variables are included. But also in waves one and two, there's quite a lot on um, novel foods and food technologies, so things like GM, attitudes to a whole range of different things. So why do we think this is important? Well, we're an evidence-based organisation and we like to have good evidence to underpin our policy decisions. So we use Food and You for everything you can imagine. So on the train on the way this morning, I was looking at um, whether there was any evidence that households who don't contain a vegetarian are inherently more risky places in terms of foodborne illness than households where there isn't a meat eater. So I don't know the answer to that question yet, but I've gone back to the analysts in the agency to say, can you have a look in Food and You? We know who vegetarians are, we know the composition of households, and we know people's reported behaviour around um, food safety practices. So this is something that we can get from our data. These kind of questions come up every few weeks, and we use this as our main source of information to at least have a first look at whether it's worth pursuing further research. Um, on wave three of a time series, essentially we're still baselining the information. The questions have changed very slightly over the waves, so we're still, still finding out really about the UK population. And some of the other things that we've used the survey to do. So in 2012, um, Food Safety Week was about don't wash your chicken, some of you may recall. Um, the reason that the comms team chose don't wash your chicken is because the results of Food and You suggested that there wasn't a good awareness of whether you should or should not wash your chicken, so that it was a message that would resonate. And certainly the social media statistics suggest that was the case. Um, we're also looking at the data to develop the theme for Food Safety Week for this year. Um, we use it as evidence to go to our board in board papers. Uh, there's virtually every time evidence or social research evidence is in a board paper, there's something in it from Food and You. So examples of that might include, um, we took a paper on GM to the board, we used the attitudes figures from Food and You. Uh, when the raw drinking milk paper goes to the board next week, then that risky foods paper uses data from Food and You. Um, the food hygiene rating scheme, which I'm not going to talk about very much today, is another interesting area. So food hygiene ratings is another one of those natural experiments. Um, those are the little symbols that you see on the doors of restaurants or places that sell food directly to consumers. The scoring is zero to five. In England, display is voluntary, so businesses get their rating and they can choose to display it. You can go on the website and find the score if you want to. In Wales, display is mandatory, so you're only allowed to sell food in Wales if you display that food hygiene rating. In Northern Ireland, we did a huge amount of campaigning in the early days of the scheme and um, display will be mandatory from April. So we've kind of got a stepped time approach. So we're using food and new data to monitor how effective that approach is to raising awareness about food hygiene in um, eating establishments. And then secondary data analysis. So um, you have to apologize some of the abbreviations that I'm just realizing are creeping in here. The IRP, that's the index of recommended practice. So we went through in great detail every question in the survey and we looked with our microbiology experts which of those questions, if you answered in a certain way, would give us confident indication that you were putting yourself more at risk. 
The answers that indicate people are putting themselves more at risk aren't immediately obvious, and in some cases it's combinations of questions. So we use that to design a composite measure to give us a, an overall picture at a population level of the um, safety status of the UK population, and I'll say some more about that in a minute. The rest of my presentation is a series of graphs and slides. The graphs mostly based on the whole sample, but if they're not, I'll point that out. And they're things that I thought would be also relevant to the presentations from RAP and DEFRA. So um, the first one I picked out, changes to eating, cooking, and shopping for financial reasons. So you can see here that um, people bought items that were on special offer much more. That's the um, biggest change. So that might be uh, representative of people still feeling um, the economic downturn. People eat at home more, have eaten out less. And the differences between the waves aren't that significant. Um, the things that are of particular concern to the Food Standards Agency, food that's eaten past its use-by date, I'm going to say a bit more about date labelling a bit later, but that, that is something we'd rather not see. Also keeping leftovers longer, because great, people are eating their leftovers, but there's a certain amount of time when it's safe to do that. Um, I guess as we're going through these graphs and diagrams, if you have questions, it's probably best to ask them as we're going through. So throwing away food. I always avoid throwing away food and then people were asked to agree or disagree with the statement. So you can see that 21% that always avoid throwing away food, that, that's quite worrying because that might indicate that people will continue to reheat and eat that food. Um, on the other end of the scale, you've got 11% who definitely disagree. So they are the ones that probably eat their food and then the rest goes in the bin. Although we didn't define here whether throwing away food is throwing away food that's left on your plate at the end of a meal and throwing away food that you haven't actually served. So it is difficult to have confidence that every question is exactly as, as you think. We do cognitive testing on the questions, but nonetheless. So you can see from the um, information in the little box that those aged 75 are most likely to agree, quite high number. Um, that's quite worrying for us because those people are probably also the most at risk of foodborne illness. And then younger people are more likely. And you can see there has been a change wave on wave which was also quite interesting. And I think we've picked out things where there is a change wave on wave. So there's something happening at the moment that is making this change. OK, food safety indicators, knowledge and use of dates. So you mentioned dates, Wandy, in your presentation. Um, I don't know how familiar you all are with dates, but this, this slide is a nightmare because the rules behind the dates are really, really confusing. And every time I have to explain it, I get myself more and more mixed up. So use by date. If you eat the food before the use by date, then it's safe, pretty much, if you cook it properly. If you don't use the food before the use by date, then you run the risk of making yourself ill. Foods that are cooked, that's less of a problem, but things like packet ham, soft cheese, things that are really perishable, you really do need to eat the food before the use by date. It is a safety indicator. The best before date is the date before which the food is in its premium quality. If you eat it after the best before date, it might not taste quite so nice, but it probably is still safe to eat. There is an exception, because there always is, and that's eggs. So even though eggs have a best before date, microbiologically, the protection of the egg, because that's the time at which it would have hatched to become a chicken, breaks down at the best before date. So we still would recommend that you don't eat eggs after the best before date. Okay? The sell by date is for the shop. You really don't need to worry about that as a consumer, as with the display until date. But the fact that they're on the products does make it quite confusing, and you can see 2% didn't know. Now, it's all well and good when you go and do your grocery shopping, checking those dates, 
but actually what's really important is that you check those dates when you eat the food because it might be in your fridge for a little while. Most people do that. They make sure that they always check 65%, 15% depending on the food type. And I've got to say, this is where I'd come in because if it's cheddar cheese or something, I'm not going to check the date every time I use it. So yeah, you can see why people are there. The 9% of never checking the dates, well, either they only buy food when they eat it or that, that's a little bit worrying. Dairy, so this is where it gets really complicated. It's for the manufacturer to decide which date mark foods have. And some time ago, there was a move towards changing the dairy durability markings to prevent so much food waste, which is a really good thing. Except one of the most risky foods that you can choose to eat is soft cheese. So then it gets really confusing because some kinds of cheese have a best before date, some kinds of cheese have a use by date. <coughs> and I, when I started thinking about this, I wouldn't have been able to tell you which had which. And I think on the slide it says pasteurised milk will have use by. Actually, the pasteurised milk in my fridge has a best before date. So we asked people about how long after the best before or the use by date they would eat the food. And I think we, we believe this is a better measure because people report doing different things with different types of food. So you can see for raw meat, very high proportion would never, more than half, 16% uh, less than one day. And I guess the thing with raw meat is by its definition, people are going to cook it. Cooked meat, 44% would never eat it past use by, but you're, you're seeing the tail there, the five to six days, the one week, the more than two weeks, starting to extend back. Dairy foods were, for some of them, the um, amount, well, they're going to have best before dates in the main anyway, but for some of them, they are quite risky. You can see that more people would eat them perhaps a little bit past the best before date, but yeah, some people would eat them quite a long way past. Eggs is the one that we really struggle with because essentially it's got the wrong date marking on. And bread, well, bread. Would you eat it if it was mouldy? Probably not. And it has a best before date. So it's kind of self-limiting. So that takes us nicely into food poisoning, which is where we're really interested. <laughs> um, and this is obviously niche to the Food Standards Agency. Um, although the Department of Health probably wouldn't want too many people to have it. Um, have you ever had food poisoning? 56% no. That means that at least 44% report. This is self-reported, so it might not have been food poisoning. And the question about what is food poisoning is really interesting, and particularly if you think of norovirus, of which there are some outbreaks at the moment, because norovirus might originate in food, but it's probably person-to-person -person contact that gives the main spread. So... Um, 6% reported having food poisoning in the last year. That's, that's a reasonable number of people. And of that 6%, 19%, so that's nearly one in five, saw a doctor or went to hospital because, it, because of it. So that's, that's quite a lot of people. Um, but you can see the country dif differences coming out here. So people in Northern Ireland were less likely to report having food poisoning than others. There's another interesting point in Northern Ireland, about Northern Ireland in a minute when we come on to the um, index of recommended practice. Some more of the stats on food poisoning. So 31, so it's quite small numbers when you think that the survey was of um, 3,500 people altogether. 31 respondents went to hospital, or went to the doctors or hospital and had clinical samples taken that were confirmed to be food poisoning. And we've listed what they had at the bottom. Um, and that's not representative of the type, the prevalence of types of food poisoning, more likely to be representative of the severity of the 
illness that they had. So six with E. coli, six virus, probably norovirus. Campylobacter four, even though Campylobacter is the most prevalent, and one Salmonella. So the next thing then is, if you have food poisoning, does it change how you or what you do? So you can see here that 33% of people who had food poisoning changed their, well, stopped going to certain places because of it. Now, there's a bit of a question around this because people seem to think that they're more likely to get food poisoning if they eat out than they are from their own home. And there actually isn't any evidence to support that. And we'd be really, really interested to get that evidence because that is, is the basis for a lot of assumptions. And we really don't know. So I think, yeah, take that as you will. 17% stopped eating certain foods. Now that might be quite reasonable. So if you think you got food poisoning from eating a particular kind of food, and the cases of raw drinking milk at the moment are one that you could see why if you were eating raw drinking milk or drinking raw drinking milk and then you were ill and it was linked back to that food, you could see why you might change. Reading food labels more carefully, hopefully that would be the date. Um, changing the way you prepare food, the way you cook food, and getting more information with other answers. Uh, we're coming towards the nutrition part now. So um, we also ask about dietary restrictions. Quite an open question about dietary restrictions. <coughs> so you can give multiple answers here, and we ask which, if any, of the following apply to you. And you can see that 9% trying to lose weight and then avoiding food for medical reasons, for other reasons, for religious reasons. So as a UK population, that's not very many for um, religious or cultural reasons, but in some ethnic groups, it's very high. So 32% of non-white respondents gave that answer. So the difference by the different demographic groups here is, is quite significant. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about attitudes in the um, final slide about the index of recommended practice, but I thought with healthy eating, attitude seems to have more of a link than with food safety, so I'd put this one in for you. Um, what you eat makes a big difference to how healthy you are, so this was about how much you agree or disagree with the following statement. So you can see that things that seem to play out, people, people know quite a lot about healthy eating. And then in Scotland and Northern Ireland, where we have much more information because we've got the three waves of data, um, so dietary changes that people have made. So this was about in the last six months. So the survey runs from April until September, so it would have been the six months prior to when they were questioned. What changes have you made? And you could give as many answers as you wanted. So you can see that the, um, it would seem that the five-a-day campaign is coming through the eating more fruit and vegetables being the most prevalent answer. But salt's in there too, fat, less calories, so all the things that you mentioned at the start. A um, bit on reasons and barriers to change. I won't run through all of these, but um, more healthy. But also cost seems to come up there quite high. I'll just leave that for a minute in case anybody wants to read it through. The index of recommended practice. So I talked earlier about this composite measure where we pulled out those questions that were really key to look at the things that people could do in their kitchens that would put them at more risk of foodborne illness. So chilling, obviously if you're going to have safe food you need to have a refrigerator that works and that you keep at the right temperature. This is really, really tricky to ask people about because it's not only that, that you need to have a fridge, then you need to keep it to know what the temperature should be. You need to keep it at that temperature. You need somebody to check that it's at that temperature on a reasonably frequent basis and know what to do if it's not to put it back within the temperature range that you'd expect. 
So if you like, the right temperature is five degree, below five degrees, naught to five. You wouldn't have it below zero because it would make everything in your fridge freeze. But equally, you need to check that that is the case because the ambient temperature in the room will affect the efficiency of the fridge. So that's, we, we get that through three questions in Food and You, but we're looking at changing it for the next wave because we're not sure it's working all that well. Um, cooking. So the best thing you can do to keep yourself safe is cook until the food is steaming hot throughout. That seems really sensible, so we've got some questions on that. Um, chicken and turkey. The way that chicken and turkey microbiological contamination is, is it's right through the meat. It's not the same as with lamb and beef, where it's only on the surface. So you really need to cook poultry all the way through. We've got questions on that. Um, how often you'd reheat a food? Every time you reheat it, you run the risk of increasing the microbial load, so we included that question. How do you tell whether it's been reheated properly? Cross-contamination is an obvious one, so washing meat and vegetables and how you store them in the fridge are the main ways we, we discriminate in that area. Cleaning, so the main thing for cleaning is washing hands. Cleaning is a really tricky area and an area where we could do with some more academic research because what is good cleaning? If you ask people how they clean, they always tell you they clean every day and they do a really good job and they use all these products. And actually, I don't do that in my kitchen and I don't think I'm that bad. Lots of people I speak to don't do that in their kitchens. And I think that people give you the social desir socially desirable answer for that question. So we really need some help with improving that. Um, and then use by date, so knowing and checking the dates. And we also ask people this question about Sunday eating. If you make food on a Sunday, when is the last day you would eat the leftovers? Because in previous research, the day that most people cooked more than they needed and saved it to use at a subsequent time was a Sunday dinner. With that index of recommended practice, we went, then went back and looked at all of the socio-demographic variables and the socio-economic variables to see which groups were most likely to do the things that the Food Standards Ag Agency recommend and equally least likely. So those that were most likely to report behaviour in line with recommended practice were women, people under 65, people living in Northern Ireland, and people of white ethnicity, particularly those who are married and those who are cohabiting. Things that we were quite surprised were not associated with a high IRP score. Education, self-reported health. So, you know, I said earlier there's this um, link that we, we were expecting between um, people who are immunocompromised or who have particular diseases that they actually are safer in the kitchen. So we haven't shown that. Um, housing tenure. The household size. The household size is really interesting and I think we need to do some more work there because it seems to get the link with the index of recommended practice increases as you increase the household size to four. Four seems to be the, the number with the highest score and then as you get bigger than four it goes down again. Um, income, socioeconomic classification, work status, religion, disability, urbanity, area level of deprivation, all not associated and all completely counterintuitive to what we were expecting. So when people say um, it's because their education and their income and so they're in a higher socio-demographic group and so they're going to do the right thing more often for food safety, certainly that doesn't apply. So this suggests that food safety, reported food safety behaviours in any case, are related to who you are, so your age and gender, not your situation, which we're really, really struggling to communicate with our marketing teams because that's not the way that you learn in marketing to segregate the population. And then finally, something about links between nutrition and food safety. So this isn't as sophisticated as the National Diet and Nutrition, safety, uh, nutrition Survey by any means, but it gives us a bit of a handle on what people think they or what people tell us they do in relation to nutrition. And the questions are all on the link to the survey on the website from the Food Standards Agency website. 
So most people know that about healthy eating recommendations and people who know about healthy eating recommendations generally also know about food safety best practice or recommended practices and we measured that with the IRP. So you can see people who score high on the IRP also are more likely to score high on knowing what a healthy diet is. Um, but then those who know more are more likely to report behaviours that are in line with recommended practice. So that might be about knowledge, not about the two lots of behaviour. So we need a little bit more work there. The links between some attitudes towards healthy eating and reported food safety behaviours. So people who think they have a healthy diet and those who kind of gave us a good understanding that they, or a good feel that they understood what a healthy diet was, even if they didn't achieve it, were more likely to report behaviours that were in line with what we would call recommended practice. But not eating five portions of fruit and veg. And that's a really easy measure. You can ask people about that. And I know that people are going to, or very likely to tell you more than they actually do. But the fact that we didn't find that correlation suggests that it's perhaps even worse than we're reporting. Um, and variation there was explained by socio-demographic factors. So older people are more likely to eat the recommended number of portions of fruit and vegetables. And women are more likely. Um, so I guess that's the end of my presentation. Um, it was food and you that I presented today. We do lots of other research, but I felt that for this audience that was probably the best thing to present. Um, it's actually Laura Inman, whose email is at the bottom, who's done the majority of that work for Wave 3. Um, she's very happy to take any questions, if you have any. And Ed Deaton is our new researcher who's come in to take over this work.